Every form of media has a few eccentricities or quirks, which can be annoying, but are usually looked past by those who enjoy these forms of media. Like, for a huge amount of time, horror games are basically just jump-scare-filled hiding simulators, or how Marvel movies are kind of the same premise, rising action, same conclusion, but with a different coat of paint. In my opinion, almost every genre of anime has things similar to these annoyances or eccentricities. And I think that in Shikimori, I found a lot of what's been annoying me lately about different types of anime. I'm not going to be talking about all the different genres in anime, I'm only going to be talking about some of the examples I found specifically in Shikimori, and only in the nine episodes I've seen thus far. If that interests you, then let's begin. Okay, let's start off with the premise. To give a quick rundown of the characters and the premise, Shikamori's Not Just a Cutie is a romantic comedy and a slice of life anime following high school students. Two main characters are Izumi and Shikamori, who are in a romantic relationship. Alongside these two are Kyo Nakazaki, Shu Inuzuka, and the best in this anime, and my spirit animal, Yui Hachimitsu. The main gimmick of this anime is the fact that Shikamori is usually a generic, cute girlfriend character, but on occasion switches into a cool, calm, and collected archetype. Like in my last video, Video, it'd be comparable to switching from regular Dante to serious Dante. This romantic comedy follows these characters on their daily lives. Nekozaki is a sporty type who became friends with Shikimori when she couldn't beat her in basketball and fell in love with her cool side. It kind of reminds me of Kokoa's obsession with the true version of Mocha and Rosario Vampire, but a bit less incestuous. Inuzuka is Izumi's best friend and on occasion protects him from Izumi's clumsiness and terrible luck. Yui Hachimitsu is trying her best to exist with these young kids, even though she herself is also a young kid. There's not really too much conflict as this is a slice of life anime. It's mostly about Shikimori trying her best to help Izumi survive his own clumsiness and terrible final destination level of bad luck. Well, for the first few episodes. Then it just kind of forgets about that for some reason and starts doing other things. Though around the time of the school festival, the best episode, in my opinion, is shown. And of course, I will get into that. But first, let's talk about what I felt was good about this anime. In a much more in-depth way than my previous video. In order to talk about the things I didn't like about Shikimori's Not Just a Cutie, let's talk about what it is that I felt worked. Especially now that more episodes have come out since my last video, and I'm caught up as of episode 9. I brought up in my previous video that I liked the fact that the anime based off of the trailer was going to be gender swamping two tropes. I'll elaborate on that now. I'm only going to be talking about how it's shown in Izumi, since it's kind of obvious how it's represented in Shikimori, if you've seen the anime. Izumi is a reimagining of the weak and nice male protagonist archetype, usually seen in harem animes. For those interested, I mention this trope because of the fact that it's a trope, not to promote my own understanding of masculinity or anything like that. Moreover, when I say I mean less capable than anyone else in the show. Also, there's the fact that most of the time, other characters move the story forward and not these archetypes. In order to avoid sounding like a Sigma grind type of guy, I'll just refer to the character as as passive, being that these archetypes passivity in the story that annoy me the most. Most people would assume I'd save Shinji from Evangelion, but he actually shows signs of growth throughout the series. Well, in the original series, I haven't really kept up with the animation move, mostly because Mari's fucking annoying and doesn't feel right. It kind of takes away from the original uh, feel of the movies and the show that it was based off of, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, he shows signs of growth in the original series in many instances, and the show itself was made to be arguably a parody of shows like Gundam series. On top of that, while Shinji has many weaknesses and acts like a weak character, he still ends up doing many things necessary to move the story forward, even if other characters are quick to dunk on him for any slight fuck-up that he shows. An example of a passive-slash-nice male protagonist would be a character like Akihisa Yoshi from Baka and Test. He's not only less skilled in most situations and fails at most things he attempts, but can be physically bested by most of the characters around him, which they're all more than happy to demonstrate for various reasons. There are some times where the supporting characters band together in order to accomplish a goal with Akihisa, but even in those instances, he's usually the first to get hurt and fail, and it's extremely rare that the show or the characters ever show any concern of what harm befalls him. He very much is the clown of the show. <laughs> 
if you just kind of want a quick rundown, this is the best way to describe it. In regards to Akihisa Yoshi and the weak male protagonist trope, or the passive male protagonist trope, the character is never shown in any way, shape, or form as strong or someone you'd want to be. He's someone you make fun of, which most characters around him tend to do. He tends to not move the story forward in any way, shape, or form, and when he tries and fails, the show's tone, dialogue, and in some instances the narrator all make fun of him for trying, basically, to do anything with the story or, in some cases, even his fucking life, which perhaps is there to subvert expectations, or it was done ironically, or some bullshit, but even if that is the case, it's not done well enough for it to be seen. Obviously, this archetype tends to be relegated to the comedy anime. So that could be one of the reasons why the main character is made to be such a loser when compared to the others, and I will not rule out that there may be some cultural differences which keep me from fully understanding why these character types existed and still do in animes like Girlfriend Girlfriend and to a much, much worse extent, Rent-A-Girlfriend. I will say that it's a good thing that this archetype has had a bit of a makeover for the most part, with characters like Tomozaki from Bottom Tier Character, Senpai from Nagatoro, and of course Miyamura from, from Horror Mia. Even earlier on than that, there was characters like uh, Haruyuki from Axel World. While those characters didn't completely address everything I dislike about this archetype, the archetype itself was used as a starting point for the main character in question, to eventually become directors of their own story, or in the very least, get closer to that compared to where they were before. Whew. Now that we know the definition, and we have some examples, let's get back to discussing Izumi from Shikimori's Not Just a Cutie, and see how he's different. The two female characters that seem to have an affinity for him are girls that he showed kindness to once, and that's basically it. Or I don't even know why it is that Shikimori and Izumi are dating, they still haven't really shown it. It explains how it is that they got together, but it doesn't really show how it is that Izumi came to know Shikimori. And it just, I don't know, we'll see how that goes, because it's been nine episodes and I still haven't seen anything to suggest why that's the case. Izumi is in a relationship with Shikimori at the start of the anime, so the harem part that usually accompanies this archetype is thankfully non-existent. In regards to physical capabilities, he's usually below average and tends to be incapable of doing most sports, or performs poorly at them. Aside from performance, Izumi is clumsy to the point where even walking can lead to him getting seriously injured. And because of these reasons, Shikimori protects him to the best of her abilities. The elimination of the possibility of a harem, as well as the dynamic that Shikimori has with Izumi, is a much healthier relationship representation than those presented in the animes I previously mentioned. On top of that, though Izumi tends to fail at most things he attempts and is extremely clumsy, the other characters don't constantly abuse him, or create an environment that makes him look like a failure. Despite some random male characters at the start of the first episode, the supporting characters treat his lack of physical capabilities and clumsiness as an unfortunate circumstance, and many times either help him out or help him recover. Being that she's around most of the time, Shikimori, rather than abusing him whenever he looks at another girl, or being extremely forward with him and then reacting violently whenever it is that he doesn't return her feelings, she actually protects Izumi and helps him with his clumsiness. As a little bit of added flavor, when Shikimori protects him, Izumi feels more attracted to her and finds her cool, which in my opinion is a much healthier way of reacting to being saved, essentially, and being protected. If you couple that with the previously mentioned character interactions, then Shikimori is able to successfully have a weak-slash-nice male protagonist and keep my attention. The dynamic that Shikimori has with Izumi is a welcome change in how most romantic relationships are represented in current anime, whether the anime itself is romantic. All that being said, enough of the series hasn't been aired for me to make this call as of writing the script, but I do believe that Shikimori felt the need to step up in order to protect Izumi as she saw his daily struggles and brushes with death and calamity. As one of the early episode shows, a person who is less skilled than Shikimori would have a tough time not getting injured if they attempted to do the same thing that she does. It would follow that a person who got injured on a daily basis to protecting Izumi would eventually use language or directly say something to him, basically explaining that he's more of a job to be around, or somebody who's unbearable. Basically, he'd be compared to an unbearable bird. Shikimori takes special care to not use such language towards Izumi when discussing what she does for him on a seemingly daily basis, and though he still feels like he gives nothing back to her in the relationship, she makes sure to comfort him and remind him that he is enough. One last thing before we move on to the bad is that episode 2 introduces a character named Kamiya. Around the time that she Shikimori is about to go double trigger and win a volleyball game against people who are literally on the volleyball team. We'll, we'll get into that. Just calm down. Kamiya looks at her both before the start of the volleyball game and after. 
In episode 7, we see her once more at the library, where soon after meeting her again, Izumi explains how they got to know each other last year through working together in the library committee. After that, Kamiya expresses extreme interest in learning about Chikimori for some reason. I... Uh, no, stay! Go with the flow! Stop! You're making me really uncomfortable! Stop fighting me! Just let this happen. After Izumi explains to her how they got together, Kamiya says some positive words about the story and moves on. And the episode ends. Episode 8 starts off with a short clip showing that Kamiya had feelings for Izumi, but Izumi chose Shikimori over her. Another thing is that it's shown that Kamiya kind of never adapted the way Shikimori did whenever she started to get attention, which of course I'll go over. Shikimori comes to ask Kamiya for her couple number since she had the same number as Izumi, which led to his confession last year, and wanted to have the same number again this year. While Kamiya does give the number to Shikimori with a little bit of a struggle, it kind of felt if things had been different, Izumi might have chosen Kamiya this year. But, of course, that's just speculation on my part. This, of course, has a negative effect on Kamiya's emotional state, though she remained calm up until midway through episode 8, where she excuses herself to gather her thoughts on the situation with Izumi and Shikamori. While on the roof, Shikamori comes to meet Kamiya to give back the couple number, and Shikamori and Kamiya have a heart-to-heart, -heart, which is reminiscent of the scenes that I liked uh, in Hormia, specifically the handshaking scene. It was a good change of pace, and the anime goes in kind of a different direction than I thought it would have. Originally, I was just going to do the script focusing on episode 8, but I decided to mention episode 9 here because episode 9 is a very good episode. What episode 9 does is it shows these characters to be characters. It develops them in a way that shows them to be interesting and something that exists outside of Izumi. I mention it in regards to Kamiya because obviously right after episode 8. Well, okay. There's episode 8 in the sub, and then there's two special episodes. First special episode is it's a commentary track added to the first episode. Second episode is the voice actors who play Izumi and Shikamori kind of discussing what's going on in the show so far. I like that. I do in fact fuck with that. That is something that got me into podcasts. It's one of the reasons why I did a couple podcasts and hope to do more podcasts with Super Chode. It's nice. I loved it. That's a positive, obviously. So there's a bit of a break between episode 8 and episode 9, but once you get to episode 9, it quickly picks up where it left off. You learn a bit more about Kamiya, you learn a bit more about Nekozaki, you learn a little bit about why is it that Shikamori kind of has this weird interaction with uh, Inuzuka, and you also get to see Hachimitsu do a little bit more than she usually does. It's overall a fun episode, and it really takes time to develop these characters. And of course, Hachimitsu dresses up like Sherlock Holmes, and it kind of makes her look like a VTuber. Forget her name, but it kind of <laughs> looks like her. So if you're into that VTuber, I mean, that's that's nice. But sadly, this is as far as the good goes. We're going to move on to... Watson! That was her name, Watson. The VTuber Hachimitsu kind of looked like when she dressed up like Sherlock. Anyway, on to the mid. As I stated in my spring 2022, yes, 2022, my problems with Shikimori's not just a cutie start with the first episode. I'm not going to go too much into that because I've already previously explained it. I do have timestamps if you want to skip forward in the description if they're not on the video itself, so go ahead and do that. But for those who didn't watch it, I'll go over it again. Dragon Ball Z. Episode 1 starts off with a few exchanges of introductions of recurring characters and concepts that viewers need to know. The show quickly gets to the dynamic that the characters have with one another. More importantly, the show takes its time to explain through character interactions and dialogue that Shikimori is one of, if not the most popular girl in the school. Midway through the episode, Izumi, Shikimori, and their friends go to the bowling alley. While Izumi and Inuzuka go off screen for a bit, Shikimori, Nekozaki, and Hachimitsu talk about what Shikimori should do in regards to how she should bowl around Izumi. Their suggestion was that she should act itzy and make it seem like she doesn't know how to play. This causes her to feel conflicted whenever it's her turn to go and uh, bowl. After she's a little bit conflicted, Izumi tells her to go for it or do her best. Gumbo. That's it. That's whenever Shikamori turns on the devil trigger and gets a perfect score, which causes everybody around her to clap, which I spoke about in the previous video. A very similar situation happens in episode 2, where we meet uh, Kamiya for the first time, except with uh, volleyball. I kind of went over it a little bit earlier when I started talking about Kamiya. The difference here is that everybody in the gymnasium does go crazy, but there's like a scene them leaving the gymnasium and being back at the homeroom, and then they open up the door and literally a bunch of girls are literally fangirling over Shikamori. This leads to a situation where Shikamori is separated from Izumi because of how many people are between them. Shu Inuzuka protects Izumi throughout this whole situation. And at the end of the episode, Inuzuka ends up being all fucked up, so he tells Izumi to go, go home the rest of the way because he, he literally just can't anymore. His health bar's low and shit, he's dying. Literally, right after this exchange, Izumi tries to go down the stairs, and in doing so, he's about to fall. This is where Shikamori steps in to save him. Your little pussy belongs to me. They have a discussion about what's been going on lately. They weren't able to hang out today, and this kind of bothers them. And Shikamori basically vows that she's not going to be doing this anymore. This is the part that I missed on my first viewing when I wrote my first eight-page script. 
she still does things to get Izumi's attention, and we're going to get into that further, but she doesn't really demonstrate it through sports anymore. Uh, later on, she kind of does, but it doesn't have the same reaction that it used to, and it doesn't stop the show the way that it used to. So, basically, the show itself and the characters within the show correct it. The next thing is that Shikimori, much like a generic male protagonist, can basically do no wrong. A good example, generic male protagonist trope would be a character like Kirito. He is an excellent example of an overpowered character because there are very few things of note about him aside from that. Even when I was closer to the demographic the show was made for, I never found myself really caring about what happens to him. But what I did care about was what happened to the supporting characters. And the problem is, and Shikimori is not just a cutie, the supporting characters don't really have a personality. An overpowered protagonist can work. Like I said, there are parts, sword art online that do work. And there's animes that literally base their entire shit around this, like One Punch Man. But unfortunately, there's not enough here for me to really care about the show. Which causes us to move on to the <laughs> I found myself saying many times while writing this script, what the fuck were their names? Because... I'm very bad at remembering characters' names. I have difficulty remembering these characters' names specifically, though, because they're so fucking generic. One of the main supporting characters, Nekozaki, is essentially just a generic sporty female character. Just by mentioning that, like, tomboy, sporty character, she's probably a hothead, she probably doesn't have much of a personality outside of liking sports, she's probably extremely competitive. You could replace Nekozaki with basically so many other characters who are the same archetype, and you would not notice much of a difference. And the same can be said about Inuzuka. But for Inuzuka, aside from being a little bit loud and obnoxious sometimes, and being competitive in a similar way to uh, Nekozaki, there's not much to him. He basically just kind of moves the story along by being there, or just giving some commentary. Like I said, the only character that was somewhat amusing, I am biased because she is my spirit animal, is Hachimitsu. And even her name is different. I only remember her name because it's so different. The only thing you can really talk about her, from what you can tell from the show, is that she loves food, and she's not very good at anything physical, even walking, basically. <laughs> and also, she has, like, the voice of an older, tired woman. But outside of that, there's not much to say about Hachimitsu. Even Izumi, the main character, well, uh, kind of the main character. Only the fact that he has a really bad case of death from Final Destination trying to kill him. And in one episode, someone mentions that he's selfless, and that causes him to save a little girl at the cost of his own safety, and of course Shikimori saves him, but that's literally just for that one episode. They tried to develop him slightly, and it was literally just for that one episode. This is a slice-of-life anime, so I understand that there's going to be some limitations on what the character's going to do, and there's going to be some limitations in regards to rising action, falling action, all that stuff. But in this particular instance, he basically doesn't do shit. Like, at all. <sighs> I feel the need to bring up Rosara Vampire. Specifically, Mocha. Mocha from Rosara Vampire had... It was called a rosary, but I've never seen a rosary that looks like that. But it was called a rosary. And Skune, the main character of that show, was able to take the cross off of the rosary. And that would cause Mocha's pink-haired, nice form to be replaced with her uh, silver-haired, true form. And these distinctions are made very clearly from the first time that the silver-haired Mocha, or the true Mocha, comes out. On top of that, rather than... It being like Shikimori, where she's just overpowered, and it doesn't really explain why she's overpowered. Rosaira Vampire actually takes time to explain that vampires are S-tier monsters. And various times throughout the show, it shows how powerful Mocha's abilities are whenever she switches to her true form. On top of that, there's a reason why these two personalities exist. It's because at, at one point, in order to make her fit better with the other monsters, the father decided to put the rosary on. And this is what created the nice pink-haired mocha personality. And it covered up the true form, which is the silver-haired mocha. But anyway, Osara Vampire takes time to explain why there's a distinction between these two char characters' personalities, or why there's basically two characters in one. It takes time to explain who's the true one. And it explains why does she's so physically apt in comparison to the other monsters monsters around her. It doesn't mean that she won't have trouble if, you know, things weaken her, but ultimately it explains why she's so powerful, it explains why there's two different versions, and it explains why is it that there's even a distinction to begin with. And Shikimori, she just is powerful. She just has these two switches. Before I move on from talking about Sorry Vampire, it never really explains why Kokowa, Mocha's little sister, is kind of mid by comparison to Mocha, but we're just gonna put that fact in the trash along with that stupid-ass bat. Anyway, Shikimori 
doesn't really have much of a given reason as of episode 9 as to why she's so good at doing things as well as she does. She simply does. Another thing I'd like to mention is that the two sides are the same person, rather than one being the true self and the other being a false self like in Mocha. Though it's implied that Shikamori's cool side is closer to her default personality than the cute side, so I'm not really sure, you know, what to believe about that. And like I said before, there's not really much of a given reason as to why these two sides exist. Maybe it's just literally her, kind of like in, um, a series of unfortunate events, what's her name, uh, the, the older sister picking up her hair, that kind of turning on a switch to make her focus, like, I'm not really sure. One last thought before we conclude. While conceptually the switch between the cute and cool side of Shikimori is comparable to Mocha, I'd say that the way that Shikimori switches is comparable to Yuno from Future Diary. Specifically one scene when Yuno's fighting off uh, a competitor that's actually a couple. Though in Future Diary, Yuno was a literal god and had already previously survived the entire game before with another world Yuki, which gives a reason as to why she basically has endless endurance and physical capabilities. She has such a wide, vast knowledge of various types of weapons. Whew, finally. <laughs> Shikimori is just another slice of life anime, and I think most people will enjoy it and treat it as such. A slice of life anime doesn't have to have a grand story, or a reason why characters do the things that they do. And I do get that. The anime I kind of wanted to see, however, wasn't the anime that was presented. <laughs> and I understand that that's more on me, to have a different set of expectations for one of the many mid-tier animes that every season has, and I think that this is where it is. It's one of the mid-tier animes to kind of throw in to pad out the season. I think Shikimori's not just a cutie, was at its best when Shikimori is protecting Izumi from his unfortunate fate. Hell, it would have been awesome if that was the entire show and it just, you know, started to build more and more and more of how awesome Shikimori is and how, like, intensely in danger Izumi is. But unfortunately, it's not the show that we got. I guess I'd like to conclude with the fact that Shikimori's Not Just a Cutie did do something good in regards to uh, the couple dynamic that exists between Izumi and Shikimori. I think that it revitalized the passive, generic, harem male protagonist trope and created a healthier gender dynamic amongst the characters in the show. Unfortunately, it also didn't take time to smooth out the edges of the backstories for the characters and didn't really take time to say something really original. It, it, it's a generic flavored anime. Overall, I think Shikimori's Not Just a Cutie is pretty mid, but not necessarily garbage. Thank you for listening to me ramble.